my experience today has been to start off with Inspire speaking, and from that point on, I just kept learning something every time somebody got on stage. It's been very exciting up to this point, and I, I must say uh, I've enjoyed all the speakers that we've had today. The last speaker is, uh, is Mr. Matt Sinclair. While our, our environmental politics has some rather unique facets, I think there's a lot that an international audience, an American audience, can learn about the nature and logic of the environmental movements from looking at the British experience. You can learn that moderate policy will not sate them. You can learn that intellectual justifications, for example, negative externalities, are a cover and will be discarded as soon as they have the opportunity. In other words, you can learn that if you feed this crocodile, it will still desire to eat you. So, firstly, I'm going to talk, to talk through a few, few subjects. First, I'm going to talk about how the Green Movement can capture the establishment. Then I'm going to talk to you about the global warming industry and the unique global warming industry that, that's developed in government in the UK. Then I'm going to talk about, discuss some of the loony, often counterproductive green policies we have. Uh, and this is provide some evidence that the logic of climate change isn't really believed, like the economic logic of climate change isn't really believed by those proposing it. And finally, I'm going to talk about some grounds for hope, in particular, ordinary people. So, firstly, on the establishment, our establishment is effectively a part of the green movement. Uh, they see themselves in this light. They see themselves as having a mission to persuade the public. And there are very few exceptions. Those exceptions are rather more endangered than polar bears. So, these, an example here. There's their love affair with an inconvenient truth. Before it was released in the UK, a special uh, screening was hosted by our Secretary of State for the Environment, David Miliband at the time. Now, our, uh, there have been repeated screenings for civil servants in what may be a unique attempt at institutional self-brainwashing. <laughs> there is uh, councils from Lewisham to East Hampshire, all these little councils, have been organizing repeated screenings in an attempt to educate the public. They even wanted to distribute it to schools. I don't think that's been discussed elsewhere at this conference. But uh, it, they, they ran into a legal challenge, and a judge wound up describing this film as containing alarmism and exaggeration, I quote, and a number of key errors. I won't go through those now. But uh, essentially, this has been torn apart in British courts. So uh, it is official in Britain now that this is rubbish, but it is still embraced by the entire British political establishment. However, they're not just concerned with importing vice presidential alarmism. We had to commission our own. Uh, the Stern Review. Now, the Stern Review essentially gets its unique results through a combination of cherry-picking the most extreme case of any particular study and uh, looking at harms, Nordhaus records, predominantly post-2800. I mean, imagine if we did this for foreign policy. We're going to go invade Chad because in 300 years' time they could get the bomb. This is a new level of absurdity in policy making. So, uh, this isn't, but this isn't treated as an outlier in British politics. It's treated as a definitive word, and not just in British politics. I believe it's very influential across the European debates, and the importance of Stern is hard to overestimate in providing cover for politicians who can say, well, Stern said it, and that's assuming that ends the debate. Now, uh, this, has, this, this establishment hasn't just captured the left. This isn't a disease of the left in Britain. It's also captured the Conservative Party, and I'm sure some of you uh, know, know what they've been up to, but I'll hopefully bring some new, some new lights to some of the real. Uh, particularly, this is the Quality of Life Policy Group. The very idea of a Quality of Life Policy Group in a Conservative Party is, is I think, uh, questionable. But this one uh, had some recommendations, including all car adverts were to have cigarette-style warnings attached to them. Uh, we were going to have... A road build, road widening, to be more precise, was going to be made the exception rather than the norm. There was to be a moratorium on airport construction and uh, innumerable other. They were going to ban standby buttons, was one particular. And they were going to tax supermarket car parks. They're just the level, uh, the number, was, this thing was 400 pages long with no executive summary, and I had to read it in the morning. So I, I've got a particular loathing for this report. Uh, but the. Now, how were they able to do this? In, and how were they able to not get completely laughed out of the room in what was the, is nominally the party of Thatcher? Uh, this, and it's because they saw Stern as too complacent. This is their words. Stern is too complacent. And once you've done that, once you, you've put yourself that far an outlier in the sort of 
academic debate, like all this stuff, like our skeptical discussion, they're so far from this. That they, like they, they, the IPCC is a dot on this on this sort of denier horizon when you when you when you're getting to the quality of life groups uh, stage in this debate. They also had an active hostility to economic growth. They weren't thinking about trade-offs. They were actively hostile. They endorsed something which another UK thinker called the New Economics Foundation created this Happy Planet Index, and they endorsed its methodology. The Happy Planet Index says, basically, we're going to look at the results of happiness economics surveys and compare those to the amount of resources you use. Now, if anyone knows happiness economics, the basic result is everyone gets the same result in every country, largely. Uh, or disproportionately in that case, it narrows differences between countries, largely because it asks people to rate their happiness on a scale. Now, a scale, everyone just, that is encourages relative measures, it encourages you to compare to everyone around you, so it misses differences between countries. The final result, I won't go into spend too long on Happy Planet Index, is that Mexico is a better place to live in the US, which would be news to all of the uh, Mexicans moving here, and Colombia tops the rankings, uh, the, way above the UK. Uh, so, this is truly a, when you've got these kinds of analysis on the line, of course you can come to these lunatic policy prescriptions that they were getting to. So, uh, beyond this, I, like the Conservative Party's position on climate change would be more infuriating if it weren't so thoroughly silly. They composed a list of heroes and zeros in the green debate. And one of the zeros is one of the co-sponsors of this conference, the CEI, something they should be very proud of at the CEI, uh, is that they are one of the zeros. And that might be an ugly attempt to define people out of the debate. One of their heroes was a topless model who urged people to have sex with the lights off. So I think perhaps there's, there's more Monty Python than Mussolini in, this, in, in, in their, their attachment to the to green politics. Nevertheless, there are now very few mainstream voices fighting this new orthodoxy. The establishment has been convinced. Now, what that means is there's very little scrutiny to green policies. A lot of really silly, silly policies. Once you get this, except so no, that's why this conference is so important, because if there aren't people challenging these policies, there's no one to put sensible checks on the kinds of policies, put sensible scrutiny on the kinds of policies coming out. So, uh, vegetarians have seen this as a massive boon, because, of course, feeding cows creates both flatulence and uses high amounts of energy. So the vegetarians love this. Uh, the global governance, those who wish for either global governance or to sort of concede more of British sovereignty to the European Union, love this because it gives them this great na uh, supranational crusade that they can uh, engage upon. Britain's fascist party, the British Nationalist National Party, described how immigration is an environmental disaster. So this, is, this isn't just the, the left who are embracing, well, well, depends on your perspective of where fascism sits on the uh, ideological spectrum. A bizarre extreme is the number of sterilizations and abortions justified, this is a very bizarre extreme, I'm not suggesting this is mainstream, being justified on environmental grounds. Tony Vanelli, this is reported in the newspaper, terminated a pregnancy and then had herself irreversibly sterilized. I think the sterilization, we could all agree, might be good news. Uh, because having children is selfish. It's all about maintaining your genetic line at the, at the expense of the planet. Mark Hudson, who's unfortunate enough to be married to a, a, a writer for Ethical Consumer magazine, had a vasectomy because it would be morally wrong to, for him to add to climate change and the destruction of the Earth. Uh, Another idea that's found new justification is job creation. The British global warming industry isn't just uh, campaigners, correspondents, etc. It shows up in surprising places. At the Taxpayers' Alliance, we studied local governments, did a sample of 30, 40 local councils, found, and our estimate is there are around 3,500 staff in local government whose job descriptions may mention uh, climate change, global warming. Uh, Tower Hamlets, a London borough, one of the poorest in the country, because inner London's very rich, outer London's very, very poor, one of the poorest boroughs in the country, their impoverished council taxpayers, many of them, are supporting 58 staff working on climate. These are, I mean, local authorities in Britain are small. Uh, when Obama and McCain tell you they're going to create green jobs, is this what they mean? Do they mean highly paid bureaucrats? Some of them aren't highly paid. Some of them are. One, of, one group were given a private equity fund by the organization the government or paid for, by the government organization they work for. They, 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 our, our politicians all drive Priuses. Hollywood movie stars and British politicians are the two big groups, I think, constitute the Prius market. So, if it is also actual industries. Uh, 15, there's an EU target to generate 15% of power from uh, renewable uh, power. 
the estimate, our main way of uh, encouraging this is the renewables obligation. So every uh, electricity generating company has to get a certain amount of its power from renew renewables. Now, it's estimated this will cost consumers about a billion pounds, two billion dollars. It's quite easy to do currency conversions these days, thanks to your weak currency. Uh, this will cost consumers two billion dollars a year by 2010. Before, now, Ofgem, our electricity and gas regulator, looks at this and works out that the, with the different green regulations and taxes, there's the climate change levy, there's the emissions trading scheme, which we'll come on to in a minute, uh, it's adding 6% to the average energy bill. 6%. Now, energy, like your energy bill, is the biggest problem for low-income consumers, particularly the elderly. In Britain, we have 20, nearly 24,000 deaths every year, excess, due to winter cold. Now, we've talked about DDT, and the, the numbers here don't remotely compare, and I'm not trying to suggest that they, they are. However, this is green alarmism killing people. There will be people who are not turning the thermostat up, vulnerable elderly people on very low incomes, struggling under council sex, etc., who will not be turning the thermostat up, who will be dying because of green regulations and because of our, our politicians' attachment to green politics. This is the really vicious side. This is when it really starts to tail on people's lives. So, other lunatic policies. I'm going to leave out uh, recycling because I don't have a lot of time and uh, there's quite a lot to go through when you talk about the lunacy of British environmental politics. But if anyone wants to talk about recycling, I'm quite happy to. There are some particularly absurd things there. But the air passenger duty. This is the du a flat rate you pay when you fly to or from Britain. Now, uh, one of the IPCC authors, Richard Toll, looks at this and he thinks it might actually, it was doubled at the last budget. He thinks it might actually increase emissions because it makes my flight it's from London to New York a lot more similar in price than if I had flown to Sydney. And, what, and people aren't not flying, they're just flying further. However, one thing it is doing is putting people off flying to the UK. They go to other countries. So uh, one of those asides that British politics in its undemocratic nature is able to ignore is that it may be costing the tourism industry uh, about 150 million pounds, uh, $300 million. So, Next onto the emissions trading scheme, because this is the one which you guys are most likely to get, for a very simple reason. Uh, and actually, this is why it, what you guys need to hit if you want to win this political battle, is that it means redistributing money from poor, struggling manufacturing areas to rich, service-driven areas. You will see a massive, massive, and we've done the sums, and I can show you these for the UK, massive uh, subsidy going from uh, area, I don't know the US economy that well, uh, but from California to... Uh, Detroit, if you get national cap and trade, massive transfers, because it needs to be the case, because the polluter pays, but the polluters are not geographically evenly dispersed. Now, onto the emissions trading scheme. Uh, 62 million pounds in admin costs alone for British firms. Uh, what, to what end? Well, the emissions trading scheme, every country gets to set its own carbon allowances, which they can then trade with other countries. They've literally been given a license to print money. What they've done is they all printed them except for Britain, because our politicians don't care about the national interest. So every country except us printed massive excess, excesses of credit, and we sent, for no good reason, about half a billion pounds each year to other European countries. Uh, this is our, the emissions trading scheme that works. done nothing for emissions at all, the European emissions trading scheme. Uh, it costs any, now, the other thing is, this is an artificial market with a lot of people who aren't very good at trading. Now, Shell and BP made profits from this scheme. You know who lost money? NHS hospitals. They lost money. The, 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 these are NHS hospitals. One hospital, it cost nearly, nearly a quarter of a million pounds. Six million pounds across the NHS. Uh, now, it also isn't a market solution. I would encourage you to do this. Go to the DEFRA website. Just Google this. I'm sure you can find it. Find the spreadsheets on their websites, which lists every, every not even major, every sizable industrial or complex in the country and their five-year plan of carbon emissions. This is your market solution, we're told, the cap and trade. It's literally a five-year plan for allocations, and then there's some trading on the side. And it's a key target for lobbyists. It's an obvious and brutal case, place for governments to fail to get these allocations right, and they do. And it's been a hideous, it's been a hideous mess. Now, uh, finally, on to green tax. Well, green taxes. We reckon, by our estimates, that we pay massive excesses of green taxes. We, re we pay uh, about 10.2 billion, or 400 pounds, 800 dollars per family excess in green taxes above 
your rates, if you look at IPCC, Stern, etc., average them out, work out how much should people be paying in green taxes, if you buy their Pigouvian logic, we're pay already paying too much. And they want to charge us more, which is why all these arguments about whether an optimal carbon tax, can, politicians won't set an optimal one. They'll set the one they want to get revenue. And this is the problem. Now, I've heard stories about $4 gas, which you're very worried about, $4 a gallon. We pay roughly $5 a gallon of tax per gallon of petrol, $7 in total. So uh, a little less of that carping, please. So finally, let's move on to a note of hope, because I don't have much time, and I don't want to leave you entirely convinced that Britain is going entirely to hell in a handbasket, although give it time. Uh, so at the height of green tax further last autumn, with every political party, every major group in the country committed to higher green taxes, we did a poll. We found there was still a plurality against green taxes, 46 to 45 percent, and with the entire political class telling this was a good idea. Equally, we found 63 percent agreed with the statement that politicians are not serious about the environment and are using the issue as an excuse to make raw, raise more revenue from green taxes. The statement I think is quite accurate, and the public agreed. The popular press reaction to the Quality of Life report was furious. Every time a, a proposal for taxes on flying or supermarket car parks, etc., was put forward, it was roundly destroyed. And that has blunted political enthusiasm for the Green Project. The Conservatives are backing off green taxes. Those proposed by the government in the budget are starting to, uh, have, we've yet to see surface. So, what I, the note of hope I'm sounding is that, and this is why a lot of Marlowe Lewis stuff about the, the laws, that law is important is that in the most democratic areas, if we get our message right, if we properly tailor our message to appeal to ordinary people, we can convince them. They will reject the vain sanctimony of much of the green movement. If we get our message right, if we appeal in a democratic forum to, to the demos, to the people, we can convince them. And that's, I think, the lesson, is that even with that huge establishment weight, all the press, everything in Britain, we were still able to win some really important fights. And that is the note of hope I would leave you on, because if it's true in Britain, I'm sure it's true elsewhere. I am sure that this is a political fight we can win if we get our message right, if we are prepared to engage in the right kind of populist fight with these people, but with the knowledge that we, ha we have this issue right. That is what I would leave you on, and uh, thank, you, thank you for listening.